every year as we celebrate with our young graduates I always like to find someone that has excelled in life for the person to share part of his life stories inspiring stories as a way of encouraging our young graduates, reminding them of what the future looks like. Sometimes it's not going to be the same as what you have been experiencing in your family, in your schools. And sometimes it's good that we hear that from other people's mouth not just from our parents and not just from our teachers. And so this year I, I chose someone that I consider that uh, has run a successful business and has excelled in life and his faith means a lot to him and his faith means a lot to us. So I I asked him if uh, he would do us a favor of uh, sharing his life story and he said yes. And uh, he has been preparing this for, for weeks now, um, kind of to show us how important this is to him. And for him, he considered this as a, a great honor. And um, in a, a wonderful way, I would like to uh, call upon Cheek Kalua to come up and share his wonderful experiences. And uh, before that, I would like to say, uh, Ruth, thank you so much for being here. So, Cheek, please. Another round of applause for Cheek, please. Thank you, Father. probably stare out here and be roaming around before we're all done here. Um, first of all, congratulations to all the graduates and the parents who through the years have supported you. Um, it's a wonderful, special event, milestone in your life. 59 years ago, I was in your shoes and I had just graduated from high school class of 1965, so quite a bit before you there. Um, three months before that, I had been accepted at the University of Notre Dame, so in the fall I knew where I would be and what I would be doing for the next four years. In fact, I knew what I was going to be doing for the rest of my life. I had decided I wanted to be a writer. And so, write short stories and novels. Be like an Ernest Hemingway, you know. Have, has anyone read any of my books at all, by the way? Anyone? <laughs> no one? Well, that's because I haven't written it. And that's the first point I'd like to go ahead and make, is that, you know, we start out with goals in our life, and we think we're gonna go from point A to point B, and it's gonna be a direct shot. But it's not that way really in life. But we run into a lot of outside encounters, things that we can't control. Detours that, instead of that straight shot, we're going back and forth and back and forth. And sometimes we end up on a tangent and we go to point C and we never even reach that goal because we find something else that's better in our life. Prime example for that was with me when I got to Notre Dame. At that time, Vietnam War was raging, and so the government was running out of young men. And they increased the pool for the draft to include those who were in college. And as a result, I ended up joining the Navy ROTC, because that gave me a four-year deferment. Plus, once I graduated, I would be an officer in the Navy. So I found that 10 days after graduation, 
I was on my way to Vietnam to meet my ship, which was operating the waters off of Da Nang. Da Nang is about 50 miles from North Vietnam and the DMZ. Now, I didn't want to be in the Navy. I didn't want to be in the military. I never thought I would be when I was graduating from high school. But I have to say that I learned more in the Navy than I did four years in college, actually. In college, I learned book knowledge. But in the Navy, I learned about life itself and the realities of life and the realities of dealing with people. And that later on became more important in my business and in my career. So, I say that to you, sometimes you're going to find yourself in situations that you may not want to be in, but embrace it, because you can take that experience and turn it into something that's really good and that you may use later on in life. After the Navy, I ended up going to Europe. I had seen one half of the world through Uncle Sam. I wanted to find out what the other half was. So I flew over there, bought a bus, an old bus that no one ever wanted. It was red on one side, blue on another, yellow on top. And, uh, but we traveled around, we went about 25,000 miles all in all in that bus. We saw 16 different countries, and we were gone for about four months. Now, when I came back, I realized another lesson in life. And that lesson was, we live in the greatest country. And we don't really know what we have until you're away from it. Now, it may not be a perfect country, but it's a privilege to live here. After I was back a couple of days, my father said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm out of money now, so I guess I better look for a job. <laughs> and he said, well, would you be interested in working for me in the family business? Now, if my name would have been Wilson or McGregor or Spaulding, I would have jumped at that opportunity. But we didn't make footballs or basketballs or golf clubs. We made wedding bands, bridal bands. I mean, it, to me, it was just a waste of time. Why would anyone want to go ahead and buy anything that they would wear for one day of their life. Not only that, but I had worked for the company during the summers in high school and in college. I didn't have a lot of fond memories of it, frankly. Uh, it started off with my dad hired me at the minimum wage, which was a dollar ten an hour at that time, forty-four dollars a week. Not a lot of spending money. The other thing is that I worked in the shipping room. No air conditioning. Hotter than hell. <laughs> and I have to go ahead and say, I was glad to get out of there. So when my dad asked me if I wanted to go ahead and work for him, I hesitated quite a bit. The only thing is, I was broken at that time. So I said, well, what, if, what would I be doing? And he said, well, I need a sales rep for the West Coast. So I would need it for you to travel in the Western states. And you would have a sample of wedding veils and show to the bridal shops and department stores. And he would take orders. And that would happen for three months in the spring and three months in the fall. And then when you weren't on the road, you would come back and work to expedite orders for me. Well, that sounds pretty good. I like the idea of traveling. And like I said, I was broke, so I said, sure, 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 I'll try that. And so four weeks later, I found out I was out on the road heading to California. Now, I thought it would be a real easy job, frankly. Eh, not quite. Uh, first of all, in those days, we didn't have GPS. So I had to go ahead and use uh, uh, an atlas, a road atlas. It had maps of all the states and the major cities. But 
It didn't tell you where construction was. It didn't tell you if you were in traffic. And didn't tell you if there were detours. So most of the time I found myself I was lost going different directions. If I wasn't lost, I was late for appointments. Now the other thing is I had these samples and there was about 75 or 80 bales in, in this black sample case. And I'd have to go ahead and wheel that thing around in the downtown areas of the cities. All the people walking around, I'm trying not to bump into them and trying to bring it up. Shoot, usually the bridal shop from the fourth or fifth floor of a department store and I would have to lug it up on an escalator and, or put it in an elevator with me and all the people are crowded around. So it wasn't an easy task either. The third thing I found out was that even though our company had a great product and we were known for our, our craftsmanship, quality, and customer service, I found people don't really like change. So when I would go into a, a store, I expected them to just be jumping and ordering everything I had. It didn't work that way. They, they would say, well, thank you for coming. But I'm really happy with the vendors I have right now. Maybe next year if you come back, I'll, I'll see you then. So that job that I thought was going to be really easy turned out to be a little more difficult than I had planned on. Now outside of that, I was lonely. You know, I was away for three months at a time and I was finding that every other night I was changing and living in a different hotel or a motel. Packing and unpacking my suitcases and the car, eating my meals by myself all the time. Now on weekends I couldn't work because bridal shops and department stores were all busy selling prospective brides. So I found myself in the hotel room by myself, just watching TV or doing nothing. After about three or four times of being on the road, I decided this bridal business isn't for me at all. I'm going to go ahead and pursue that job as a writer. And when I got back to Chicago, I thought I would go in and talk to my father, but he beat me to the punch and said, we need to talk. Now I thought he was going to go ahead and say, you're doing a great job. I'll give you a promotion. But he didn't. He said, while you were away, your uncle decided he wanted to retire. And my uncle was a junior partner in the company. And he said, so, I want to know before I do anything, are you interested in joining me and being my partner and having a third of the company? Now, I was kind of in shock. My feather could have knocked me down. But once again, from past experience, I said, well, what would I be doing? And he explained that I'd be working inside, handling production, scheduling orders, and in general, handling the personnel. And I decided at the age of 25, that was an opportunity I couldn't pass up. You know, I would be making more money than most of my friends out there, and an owner of a company. So I said, sure. And four months later, I found myself signing a letter on a partnership agreement. Now, I wasn't naive enough to think that my job would be just sitting back in a comfortable chair at a big desk, writing up orders and talking to people, and going home at 5 o'clock. But I wasn't quite prepared for what I was going to be doing. And my job entailed, at first I was starting out at 7.30 in the morning and opening up the factory. Our lady started at 8 o'clock, so I needed to make sure everything was ready for them. The other thing is I spent the rest of the morning trying to go ahead and order supplies so that we would keep up with everything. Now, that doesn't sound like much of a job, but actually it was a big job. And I say that because we didn't have computers back then. Everything had to be done physically. So it meant taking inventory constantly. Now we carried a couple hundred bridal bales. And with that, it meant that 
we had a lot of components that went into it. You had frames and laces and beads, fabric. And so it meant that I had to keep track of about 1,500 items. And you say, not an easy task. And so when I would go ahead and start, and by the time I finish, it might be a week or a week and a half. Now, it doesn't seem like it's tedious, but you also are trying to check up on orders that you had already placed that might have been late. And if you didn't have everything ready or we were missing something with supplies, you couldn't produce your item. So it was a very important ingredient. In the afternoon, I would spend all my time trying to get the orders out because if they didn't go out on time and you missed something, it wasn't like you were making furniture and one day or two days it wouldn't make a difference. We were dealing with weddings. And if you did go ahead and miss a day, well, you'd find out you would be losing customers. So, most of the time I would be doing that. Sometimes I had to go back and jump in the shipping room, help them out so that orders could go out for that day. Sometimes I had to even make deliveries again back in the, to the customers in downtown. And I even found when we were shorthanded, myself sweeping them up on the floors. It was a lot of hard work and I spent usually about 11 to 12 hours a day doing this. And if we had to work overtime, it was a matter of spending about another six hours on a Saturday. But I learned a lesson out of that too. And that lesson is that hard work does pay off. And the harder you work, the greater the benefit. The more the effort, the bigger the reward. And we found that our sales all of a sudden kept on increasing and increasing with more salesmen, more profit. So eventually, I was able to hire a general manager. And that kind of eased a little bit of my, my burden on it. So with a little bit more time on my hands, and then I was making some pretty good money, I decided, well, I want to have a place where I can get away on weekends and enjoy, maybe even have a retirement home. I had been coming up here to White Lake as a young boy. My neighbor had a cottage up here on the lake. I loved it. So I decided to come up here and start looking for a place. But I couldn't find anything at all. And then one day my dad said to me, you know, I found a place for you up on White Lake. I said, White Lake? I said, what do you know about White Lake? You've never even been there. And he told me about a friend of his, Bill Grunfeld, and he had seen, and Bill said, well, they were going to sell their family place. I said, well, Dad, they want a resort. I said, I want a resort. I just want a little cottage. My dad said, well, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up. It doesn't hurt just to go up there and check it out. You have the time. What do you have to lose? So I thought, well, oh, why not? And I did. Now I found the place needed work. Needed a lot of work. But I saw the potential. It was on 1,100 feet of lake front and on 10 acres of land, which was one of the largest pieces of property on the lake. And so I found myself about a month later, signing a contract, a land contract, and buying that. Now, the hard work actually was to my benefit because I found that that hard work balanced off the pressures that I had with the private business. And so, during the week when I was under all the stress, I was ready to go up to Michigan and do work. And when I'd done the work for the weekend, I was ready to get back there and have that pressure over business, balance of life. And I think that's important that we all have. You need to have a little bit of time for work, but you have to have a little bit of time for fun. 
a little bit of time for family, but you also need to have a little bit of time with your friends. And you also need to have a little bit of time with God. You need to have that spiritual side with you. Now, I found out that after I bought the place, and I went back and forth for about 20 years on weekends, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it tremendously. And during that time, our business started really doing well. We had opened up showrooms by that time in New York and Atlanta, Dallas, Chicago. And we had put on some extra sales reps. So I found myself in a place that I thought was perfect. I was making more money than I ever dreamed I would ever. And I found I was having all kinds of time with my friends to enjoy the resort. In fact, I felt like everything in my life I had under control. But that was about to change. And what happened was, or so, a new competitor came into private business, China. And at first, they didn't make any difference in their product. It was really cheap. And, but a couple years later, they kind of found out how to make their products to the American market, here towards them. And so I found out that they could go ahead and make that product and be one third of my cost. <clears throat> and it didn't take long for all of a sudden sales to start dropping and dropping and dropping year after year. Even to the point that we started not even making any money. We started losing money and it started to go into our retained earnings. I were retired. Now, the second thing that happened also at that time was I had been dating a lady, Ruth, and I had been with her for 15 years. Now, 15 years. But, she came to me and said one day, I'd like to go ahead and go out with another person. He's been asking me out. And I keep on saying no. Now, all that period of my life, she was really faithful. Very loyal. I can't say I was. I used to date a number of women. And so when she asked me if that would be okay, I said, sure. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. I didn't think anything would come of it, really. I thought after a little while, she'd be back. Kind of took her for granted. But that didn't happen because on the first date, the fellow that she was going with said, you're the lady I've been looking for all my life. You're the lady I want to marry. Obviously, she said goodbye to me and pursued a whole new relationship. Now, here I thought of Ruth took her for granted, but I thought of Ruth as spoke on my wheel of life. But she wasn't a spoke on it. Wasn't like my business or my friends in Chicago or my friends in Michigan or even my family. She was the hub of my life. And she's what held everything together for me. And once she was gone, I realized the mistake I had made and I went into a deep depression. I couldn't even go ahead and run the business very well because I just went through motions. I couldn't make decisions. Third thing that happened to me was in February of 1998, my dad had a stroke. Now, about a month later, he died. I not only lost my father, but I lost my mentor. I lost my partner, 25 plus years. More importantly, I lost my best friend. I was devastated. I found myself at the business now just about ready to go into the red. We owed money to our creditors, so I had to do something. 
we had bought a piece of property at that time where we were going to build a factory. This was back before China came in. So I tried to sell that, but I had no takers at all. Then I decided I better put up our building where our plant was, property that we had. And that did sell. And I scrambled around trying to go ahead, find a place that I could rent to keep the business going. But as I did, my office manager said to me, are you sure you want to do this? Aren't you throwing good money after bad? And I realized she was right. And so after 88 years of being in business, including two world wars, Great Depression, I decided I needed to close it up. Did. So once I closed the business, I realized I had to get rid of the resort. Because during the years, the resort just broke even. But it needed to have renovations. It had been 20 years since I had bought it. And I didn't have any money. This was the lowest point in my life. I had lost everything that I had worked for completely for all those years. Everything except one thing. That was God. See, when I was starting out and I was a partner with my dad, I decided I needed to partner. I was under all the pressure and the stress. And so I started going to Mass every day. And when things were going good, I thank God for the blessings that he was giving me. And when things weren't going so well, I prayed for him to help me. And when I had decisions that I had to make and I didn't know what to do, I asked for his guidance. And he was always there. Now at this time, once again, I was asking for his help. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. I could hear a voice in my head saying, trust in me, be patient, I am with you. It's happened over and over and over again. As I say, this was the lowest point in my life. I can remember at night, laying in my bed, tears running down my cheeks. And I would cry myself to sleep. Nothing happened. My faith was tested. But it never faltered. And I kept on praying. Then one day, I got a phone call. And it happened to be that realtor down in Chicago. He said, guess what? I have a contract in my hand. That property that you want to sell? Well, someone offered us a full price with no contingency. And you come down and sign it. And I did. And after that, I had the money to pay off all our creditors. And even have a little bit of extra for me. Then a couple weeks later, after that, I walked into the house where I lived at the resort. There was a card on the door. I looked at it, and it was from some fellow who had been passing by and saw the property. And the card, he said, I'd be interested in buying your, your, your land. So I called him up and arranged for a tour and showed him the cottages, showed him the house. And he said, yeah, I'd like to buy it. And a few weeks later, we drew up a contract and signed it. He had given me 50% down. On top of that, the other 50% he was going to go ahead and pay me the interest and principal on over a long period of time. Once we had done that contract, I knew that I was going to be okay financially for the rest of my life. 
My prayers were finally answered, though, a couple years later when I got a phone call. I picked up the phone, and it was Ruth on the other end. And she had said that she wanted me to be the first one to know and to hear it from her, that she had broken off her engagement, and that the relationship with the other fellow was completely over. Now, of course, I wanted to jump in my car and immediately drive down to Chicago, throw my arms around her. She said, no. She said she needed time to heal. And if we were going to get together again, we needed to take time, start over from the beginning very slowly. But she needed to rebuild the faith that she once had had in me and the trust that she had once had in me. And so we did, little by little. And in the Christmas Eve of 2002, I asked her to marry me. She said yes. Thank goodness. In 2003, she quit her job, sold her house, moved up to White Lake, into our new house, our log cabin that I had built for her on the lake. In 2004, on August 7, we got married. And we celebrated the event for four days with 200 people and family members. I guess I would go ahead and say if I was a writer, I would end that book, that love story with They Lived Happily Ever After. On that note, I did do some writing. On those times that I was in the hotel room on weekends and didn't have anything to do, I started writing short stories. And when the time when Ruth and I weren't together, the dark ages, I ended up going ahead and writing a lot of poems and songs for her. <clears throat> and in the time when we were being very successful in our company. All of a sudden I found out that I had won the respect of a lot of my competitors. You know, I became pretty well known among the people in the bridal industry. So the magazines from time to time would ask me to go ahead and write articles for them. And they were the, in the trade magazines that were distributed at the shows and at the stores, the bridal companies. And so, in that way, even though I didn't get paid, I did get published. So, I did have a writing career to a certain extent. It wasn't what I had in mind, but it was what God wanted. It was God's plan. God had a plan for me. He has a plan for each and every one of you. So, to the graduates, I say, sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. It's the ride of a lifetime. In conclusion, I'd like to go ahead and read something I wrote. Wrote it for Father Peter on his 50th birthday. Uh, he's always talking about the Irish priest. Well, I'm three quarters Irish, so I thought I would go ahead and write him an Irish blessing. And I'd like to share it with you today. I think it's appropriate for all you graduates. May God give you knowledge, make you wise, and much more, as you help all his children, both the rich and the poor. May the Lord give you strength and the power to fight for all that is good and for all that is right. May the Lord look upon you as you help those in need and triple your blessings for every good deed. May God love you and hold you keep you in sight and continue to bless you.
all the days of your life. God bless.